Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. Now that my two obligatory informative videos are done for the day, it's time to talk about current events in the online fitness community. And I know a lot of you guys are like, oh man, did you see what Junkie Ward said about Lane Nordstrom? Did you see Johnny Bravo's latest video? Yeah, I saw that. We'll get to that stuff later. But I want to talk to you guys about a debate that got released today. So let me put on my plus five hat of weaponsmithing. Work on skill now my crafting a little bit. And uh, let's talk about this. And I don't do this often. On occasion I do. I'm going to link the video down below for you guys. And uh, by the way, people are always like, what are you doing with that machine? Are you pressing coins? I don't know what pressing coins mean. I'm resizing 9mm brass. Hence the hat of weaponsmithing. Now, on to this debate. It was between two very well respected individuals here within the online fitness community. Dr. Mike Isratel and Dr. Eric Helms. Now, I think most of you know I'm going to be biased on this. So what I'm going to do on this, I'm just going to give my opinion on this debate. You guys can go watch the debate for yourself. It's an hour and a half long. Uh, watch it for yourselves. People already know that I'm going to be more biased towards Dr. Mike. Uh, I generally consider him to be a more experienced individual. I think he's a, he's a more reasonable individual than uh, Eric Helms on a lot of things. I just think he, I feel like he has more practical experience. And uh, obviously because he's a Jewish doctor, he's probably smarter. Um, just throwing that out there. Just I'm just kidding on that one, but not really. But that being said, that being said, I am slightly more biased uh, towards Mike. I am. I am. I'm slightly more biased. And a lot of it has to do with my stance on Helms based upon his take on bodybuilding. Like everything's always about bodybuilding to him. And the, the problem is that it makes it seem like that's all anyone cares about is bodybuilding and natural competitive bodybuilding in the fitness world. And my opinion is that I think bodybuilding needs to be extracted from the fitness world. I don't think the term bodybuilding and fitness belong in the same sentence other than to say bodybuilding isn't healthy. Bodybuilding isn't fitness related. And that was my biggest problem with Eric during this debate. Now, I will say that I think Eric won a major point against Mike. He won a major point, and so I'm, I'm willing to overlook my bias to admit that. Um, and it's based upon a very good observation as well as looking at the scientific literature. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but what really bothered me the most with the debate was every time something came up, it was always, well, with natural bodybuilders, natural competitive bodybuilders, it's like, Eric, who gives a shit? We're talking about bulking. We're talking about bulking and muscle gains. Okay, no one cares. That's such a tiny little niche. Natural competitive bodybuilders is a tiny niche that almost nobody cares about. Millions of people watch YouTube fitness. I can assure you millions of people don't watch. Watch this. No one cares. We understand it's your, your niche area. That would be like me making every single video about competitive powerlifting. All right, this, this should be about fitness. I didn't say bodybuilding debate. So we don't need to take it there. And then my problem with that too is also the, the fact that he doesn't talk about how unhealthy it is the fact that his own research the blood work and stuff pulled on these natural competitive bodybuilders was horrific it showed that when they reached certain body fat percentages their uh, bodies were in pretty bad shape their hormone profiles were catastrophic and he doesn't talk about that more and I wish he would talk about the destructive nature of getting that lean of, of getting that lean uh, for any sort of extended period of time that it's not good for you and there are major negative effects on your body, and that has to be discussed. And those negative effects are just as dangerous as being morbidly obese, okay? So we can't harp on one without harping on the other. It's not it's not balanced. And kind of a little pet peeve, he's always, well, I've only coached two guys out of my hundreds of clients who were enhanced. It's like, don't give us that shit, bro. We know, anyone who knows how drug testing works, who knows anything about anabolics, knows that natural bodybuilding drug testing is so weak that anyone to, with two brain cells to rub together can pass it. In fact, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say if you can actually accurately track your macros, plus or minus 10%, can figure out how to use a digital scale and how to carry the one and everything on the math, 
you could pass the most stringent drug testing while cheating in a natural bodybuilding show. Okay, don't give us that. Now, the real debate, a lot of it had to do with their differences on how much weight should you gain, particularly as you get more advanced, and how fat is the level that you should allow yourself to get. Um, I think they each won in a separate area there. Uh, and I think with a lot of it, with what Mike pointed out, he's like, you know, I think that you need at least a couple of months, if not up to four months of continual weekly weight gain. And it's not, it has nothing to do with the nutrition end because Helms would say, well, you could take many cuts and other things. And I think Mike very succinctly put that point that it's not just about the nutritional end of it. It's the fact that muscle changes. And keep in mind, his PhD is in kinesiology and exercise science. That a lot of the structural changes that occur is a building process and they require long-term adaptations. And if you stop gaining muscle or you stop gaining weight too quickly, you will interfere with that process. And that you have to gradually build up on things and gradually increase volume. And then you can go through periods of time where you attenuate the volume and you resensitize yourself to training volume, but you need to make those long-term changes. And if you cut your bulking too short, you're gonna get hurt there. It's gonna hurt your gains. And it's gonna affect you on the training end and the structural end inside the muscle tissue. And, and I, I think that was a fantastic point. Um, something that doesn't get addressed by a lot of people because he's not addressing it just from the nutrition end for people like uh, Eric who have their background in nutritional sciences. He's addressing it from the actual muscular end of what's going on in the internal structure of the muscles, that you need that prolonged weight gain. Now, the other thing he pointed out is that with the aggressive weight gain, if he, he said, even more advanced lifters, I'm gonna go out and say, for an advanced lifter to make any appreciable gains in muscle mass, you might have to gain 75% body fat as far as your weight gain goes. In other words, sometimes three pounds of fat for each pound of muscle that you gain. So a three or four pound a month gain might be warranted in the hopes of gaining one pound of muscle, um, some of which you might lose when you cut body fat later. But the, the reason being is that for more advanced lifters, gaining any muscle mass is so difficult that if you do not absolutely ensure that you gain weight every week, you have no way to ensure that you're gaining muscle mass. And we kind of go back to that other point of you can't afford downtime. You need a relatively prolonged period of time in which you are gaining muscle mass consistently every week to make those long-term structural changes. And if you have weeks where you don't gain any muscle because you tried to be too conservative on your, your bulking, because if you're gaining body fat, you could very well end up gaining no muscle mass on your bulk or not enough to be measurable. In other words, you don't want to bulk for three months, four months, and gain less than a pound of muscle out of it, right? You don't want to gain two ounces or three ounces of muscle. And that's kind of his really strong points there of why he, he points towards aggressive bulk. Now, what's interesting, even his idea of an aggressive bulk is not the dreamer bulk a lot of guys do, where it's like, oh, I'm going to gain 10 pounds in a month. Um, he, he's not advocating that. He is advocating a more aggressive bulk that a lot of people would, and that you need it to be like two to four months long, continuous with no mini cuts. You could take mini cuts at the end of that four months. All right, if you want to cut for four weeks, you cut for four weeks, and you can go back to your bulking again. Uh, and during that period, you know, you would scale the volume back and resensitize yourself to training volume. Uh, the other thing is that he also tells people not to go above about 15% body fat as you get more advanced. And his reason for that is that you can develop what he's calling anabolic resistance, even though there's not really evidence of that. And I think that is where Eric was able to, to knock him down a bit. Because I think outside of that point, I think, in my opinion, because again, I like Dr. Mike, I feel like uh, he was winning the discussion for the most part. Well, they didn't disagree on a lot. Uh, they agreed on more points than they disagreed on, which you would expect from two professionals with, with who have real-world experience in sports. They have both done bodybuilding. They both compete in other sports outside of that. Um, they both have PhDs in their respective fields related to this. Uh, so these guys are not exactly noobs. So you would expect them to, to agree on 90% of points. Now what Eric disagreed with Dr. Mike on was that from that anabolic 
resistance, he doesn't believe it's actually real. In other words, he doesn't believe that just because a person hits 20% body fat or even higher that there's any scientific evidence that would prove that they gain less muscle mass from their caloric surplus. Meaning like people have believed this that well, you gain less muscle and start gaining more and more fat when you reach a certain body fat due to nutrient partitioning and anabolic resistance. And he disagreed because number one, the only evidence he's ever seen of that was in sedentary populations. And people forget that. Sedentary, obese people who overeat gain muscle. They gain muscle just from the food. It's anabolic. They just gain a lot more fat than muscle. They might be gaining five pounds of fat or 10 pounds of fat for every pound of muscle they gain, but they are gaining muscle. Someone puts on 200 pounds of body weight, they gain muscle. They gain significant amounts of muscle. It just doesn't look like it because they're getting so fat. But he pointed that out that when you're physically active and training, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case because things like the, the insulin resistance and stuff may not build up as much. Uh, the other point, the other point he made with that is that if that was the case, then why do we see people like sumo wrestlers who have higher fat free mass indexes than the top drug tested bodybuilders in the world? In other words, you'll see guys who are holding pro cards in natural bodybuilding when you throw them on a DEXA scan who have less muscle than sumo wrestlers do. Those sumo wrestlers, just from their training, which usually doesn't even involve weights, throwing around their body weight and the throwing and wrestling and the massive overeating, seem to gain enormous amounts of muscle. In other words, their enormous 10,000 plus calorie diets are continually stacking muscle on them to go with that fat. They're bigger underneath their fat. They are holding considerably more muscle tissue than the, the biggest, presumably, natties out there. Some of these guys under, under all that fat are probably close to the smaller IFBB size guys uh, because the food itself is so anabolic and it doesn't slow them down. And the same thing, super heavyweight power lifters, a lot of these strong men who are 350, 400 pounds still seem to be stacking on enormous amounts of muscle month after month, even though their body fat might have hit 20% or higher. Uh, they, they seem to continue to gain muscle. The anabolic re resistance from gaining body fat doesn't seem to be real. It's just that you're eating so much that you're gaining a very disproportionate amount of fat if your, your intake is too high. Uh, so again, he, he pointed out, and I think correctly, that the, sci the scientific literature doesn't back the other theory, and we have multiple types of athletes who carry high body fat who continue to gain very large amounts of muscle and strength year after year in spite of carrying the body fat. It doesn't seem to be slowing them down, it's just putting uh, needless excess fat on them. It doesn't seem to be slowing their muscle at all. Uh, so, you know, point to Dr. Helms on that one because that makes sense. I think I think he presented that very well. Uh, and he, I think he is probably right on that. But I think with some of the other points, I think Dr. Mike was very succinct in that. And I think it shows uh, Mike's very strong understanding uh, in regards to how the body itself at the muscular level adapts to training both in the short and the long term. And I, and I think again, his expertise on that area presented some really good points for not doing uh, cuts too soon of you need to have a prolonged bulk if you want to gain significant muscle and you need to be seeing the scale move up at least a little bit every week you have to be ensuring weight gain and also he pointed out that then once you get more stable into it if you're bulking longer you don't see the same transient shifts in body weight due to fluid balance and you can really start to track it more closely whereas if you start bouncing around and doing too many cuts too quick in there um, you can lose track very quickly of your changes in tissue weight, which again is going to interfere with the long-term adaptation. So I think like two out of the three main points there, I've got to give it to Dr. Mike, but I think on that other one regarding the anabolic resistance, I think Dr. Helms knocked it out of the park. Overall though, um, I think Mike did a slightly better job, but they both did a good job. And like I said, my biggest complaint usually with Eric is that I would like him to step outside of talking about natural competitive bodybuilding. And it's because I'm of the opinion that I would like to see competitive bodybuilding just kind of disappear. I'm not a fan of it. Um, and I'd like to see this stuff apply to general fitness enthusiasts more and athletes in real sports. Uh, because bodybuilding is not an actual sport. It, it's 
a death cult. This, then that's my opinion of it. That has nothing to do with athleticism or performance. But again, I will admit that's my personal bias. That's my opinion. Uh, you might hold a different one. And you know what? That doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong. You're entitled to that opinion. To what opinions are. Everyone has one or we're all entitled to them unless it's an area which we aren't qualified to have one. All right, guys, um, but that's really all I have to say on that today. By the way, if you like this video, remember to click like. If you hated it and you're here as a hater, be sure you click the dislike also because all the engagements count. I get credit for all of them. If I've got you banned from commenting, go ahead and comment anyway so I get more engagements because uh, it'll throw it into a special folder where it doesn't go public, but I still get credit for it. And uh, <laughs> if you guys want to support my channel in any way, Feel free to share this channel if you want to support me financially. I don't expect any donations. I don't want any donations. But if you want, you can use my Amazon link, which is found on my main channel page here. On my main channel page here. Next time before you check out, it gives me a tiny little cut. Uh, but no, I don't want anyone to donate directly to me. There's no need for that. Um, so I hope it's been informative. And I will talk to you guys next time.